B comma oh, marker. Thanks, Ben. We good? So your childhood, where you grew up and what your family was like? I had a really special childhood. I'm the daughter of two immigrants. Uh, my dad was born in Hong Kong and my mother was born in Shanghai and they came over to Canada to study. And uh, they wanted the best for my brother and myself. He's three years younger than I am and they, they came to America like so many to give us the opportunity for an education. They always preserved a very special and deep Chinese heritage, so I grew up in a very authentic Chinese household with a lot of values. But I was, um, you know, a daughter and they had a son and we were always taught that girls could do anything boys could do. And what were your favorite things to do with your mother? My mother is probably the biggest inspiration in my life still today. She was a chemical engineer. She was the only chemical engineer to graduate from her class at the University of Toronto, and so she was a working mom. Most of my friends' mom stayed at home, but she was a real role model all the way through. And did she have, were there, were there any favorite sayings she had or things that, you know, dictums that she sort of inspired you with? Oh, my mother's sayings continue to drive me in my life. She always told me never give up. I remember in my very first job, probably three months into it, I felt like I was doing some really menial tasks and I called and said, you know, maybe I should be doing something more with my education and maybe I'll quit. And she said, quit? You can't quit. We don't quit in this family. And that concept of perseverance has been taught to me through her um, day in and day out for my, my whole life and obviously my whole professional career. And when you went to college, what were your expectations on graduating? Did you think you'd have a career? Did you think you'd work briefly? Did you think you'd be a homemaker? I actually wanted to do something idealistic, like join the Peace Corps. And uh, when I graduated from Princeton, they had all kinds of wonderful programs where you could go, whether it was to Africa or Asia. And, um, you know, my family didn't have that much money. And so I think they thought, well, that might be nice, but you need to go get a job. And I always thought that the two were separate paths, that you could either do something philanthropic or purposeful or you could go to work. And um, I took a job, I went to work, and sort of full circle today in my life, I feel like um, my role at Avon and the work that we do, it's a little bit of doing both. So it's sort of purpose-driven company, purpose-driven growth. So I get to do the best of both. But I thought when I got out of college that I needed to get a job even though kind of that, that moment where you think, I wanna go do something to change the world. And you did English literature, didn't you? I did. Talk about the path into business for you. Oh, crazy path. I, um, I think the greatest thing about um, education today is you get a fantastic humanities or liberal arts education. You know, People think, well, you can't go into business if you study English literature. But I think it's about following your passions. I mean, it was an extraordinarily disciplined education I got. I got to um, really explore and expand my mind. Um, and it was a fantastic major, a fantastic opportunity. Part of going to, to Princeton was writing a senior thesis. So I don't know if you know Catherine Mansfield, but I, I um, had sort of studied Virginia Woolf and then really dove deep into Catherine Mansfield and her work. And she was really a feminist, and she was really ahead of her time in that early 20th century English literature. And uh, I think she really had that exploration of women changing times in London and in England. and. Um, the, the women's movement. And I think that's shaped me somehow, but it was my thesis in 1979. You're coming of age, you're, you know, you're 20 and 79, so women's movement probably peaking in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, when you're a little bit younger. Are you aware of it bubbling up? Aware, but I, you know, certainly, I don't think I grew up as a feminist. As I said, my family, not just my parents, but even my grandparents, um, you know, they, they were ahead of their time. I mean, if you kind of go back to traditional Chinese heritage or Asian heritage, you know, one might think that this concept of kind of women walking a step behind men or not taking important roles. I had a grandmother and a mother who were exactly the opposite. And they used to tell me from when I was extremely young that girls can do anything boys could do, I could do anything that my brother could do. So I, I grew up with that very supportive philosophy. Um, you know, I did go to a university that just started co-education. And so there were not half women, you know, we were probably, it was probably, you know, one out of five. And, um, but by the time I graduated, the, the class coming in was 
And so just even in those four years in university, I think it became very evident that the age of all men's schools or all boys' schools was changing uh, when I got into the workforce right after college. I think that uh, I was fortunate. I've had a lot of mentors uh, over my career, even from the early days. I had a, a fantastic mentor. Her name was Barbara Bass, and she still is a mentor of mine. But uh, she was one of the first young female vice presidents in the retail business. And um, you know, she kind of took me under her wings and pulled me through. And that, those were in the early 80s. When you started work, then, did you feel, presumably still fairly few women? I mean, it's not the first big wave graduating, but not that many in senior positions. How did it feel? It's so different today. Um, you know, I remember <laughs> through most of my career being either one of or the only woman around an executive table. And um, it's, it's a, a different picture here at Avon today. Hopefully I like to think that we are, um, you know, very balanced in terms of women and men sitting around a board table or the, the company's senior executive table. But back then when I was kind of coming through my early years of my career, you know, it was more often than not being one of just a few. Were there any, I mean, I've heard, you know, some stories, Shelley Lazarus, for example, was talking with a little bit, you know, slightly different generation, but was talking about some jaw-dropping comments in job interviews or work, just, you know, we've only got five spots and why would we waste one on, on a woman? My famous story is actually the opposite, which is why I came to Avon, but my very first interview with Avon was the, with the then chairman, his name was Jim Preston, and he had a plaque behind his desk that had four footprints. This was in 1993. And I think maybe there was one woman CEO in the Fortune 500 at that time. And it was four footprints, and it was a barefoot ape, and then a barefoot man, and then a wingtip man's shoe, and then a high heel. And it simply said, you know, the evolution of leadership. And I thought to myself, wow, that's extraordinarily progressive. And of course, you know, he was a, a male CEO, and I asked him before the interview was done, I love that plaque behind your desk. Do you really believe that? And he said, Avon is a company that is um, mostly about women, and we should be one of the first companies someday to have a woman running this company. And I didn't even have the job yet. I was still in the interview process, but I thought, that is really ahead of the times. And to have a, a CEO, a man, say that in 1993, I thought, this is a company that has really, I'm sure, walks the talk. If you just fast forward all the years later when I be actually became the CEO, wrapped up with a bow, that plaque arrived at my office, so I have it behind my desk right now. Tell us what Avon is and how it started. Avon is the most extraordinary company. I'm biased, of course, but uh, we began the very impressive and long-standing journey in 1886, so 125 years young, I like to say. But uh, very few companies have survived and thrived over a century and a quarter, and Avon is one of them. Avon was founded by a gentleman named David H. McConnell. He had been an encyclopedia book salesman door to door, but he had a very prescient and revolutionary idea, and he went and started his own direct selling company in 1886 that um, really, most importantly, was celebrating women and economic independence. So the first Avon representative, the first Avon lady, if you would, was a woman named Mrs. P.F.E. Albee. This was, again, 34 years before women could vote in the United States. It was rather heretical that women could be out of their homes um, and earning independent income. Not a popular idea, I don't think, in 1886, but he was a visionary. And um, he was a man who believed that uh, women should be self-empowered. And so the DNA of the company and the original founding was, you know, today we sell lipstick and we sell skincare and uh, we are the largest direct selling company in the world. But the very initial premise of the company was to empower women, to be able to be economically independent and self-sufficient way back then. And that, I think, is the power of the company that is now in 100 countries all over the world from that, that very, I think, novel but powerful thought. So he created an industry of uh, economic empowerment for women. Lots of other direct selling companies have um, come into the business since that time, but uh, as the largest company that serves well over six and a half million independent representatives uh, all over the world, that is the force of the company and that's what we still do, is create earnings opportunities for them. Uh, Avon's the largest micro lender, if you would, in the world. Uh, so every single day, 
Uh, we are helping women get into business, helping them learn to run their own businesses and helping them to kind of change their own lives and their families' lives. Tell me about Mrs. Albie and what was she like? There are so many things written about Mrs. P.F.E. Albie. Every one of our Avon representatives today has heard the stories and she's the iconic first. But uh, she's representative of a woman who, you know, knew how to change her own life, to change the lives of customers she taught. Uh, all of the best-selling tips and tools today come from some of the earliest writings that he and she um, put together for the company. But she was a woman who, again, 34 years before women could vote, proved that uh, you could be economically independent, you could be a small businesswoman, and really ch make a difference. When did the company really take off? Is it Second World War? Is it sort of baby boom? Well, the company c has continued to, to grow. Uh, one of my favorite stories is that Avon representatives sold war bonds um, during the war, that they've always uh, come to the community uh, and to the world with, even in times of hardship, with um, their ability to, to affect uh, society. So that, 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 I think, speaks volumes. But the company, over the decades, if you look at it, um, was Again, there survived both world wars, survived the Great Depression in the United States, um, and then began to expand internationally. And uh, well over 50 years ago, we began operations outside the United States, starting in Canada, then moving to Latin America. Today, Latin America is the largest region in the world. Brazil is the largest country for Avon. And uh, we have, I think, more Avon representatives than the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy combined. So it's a powerful force. But the company has grown and expanded, again, really in the last 50 years, if you look back over the decades, we uh, hit $10 billion in 2008 and have been growing ever since. There are 60,000 plus companies that are in direct sales in the history of the industry. You know, less than 40 of them have hit $100 million in revenues. Only 13 have hit a billion dollars. And only one company in direct sales is over $10 billion, and, and that's Avon. So I think it sort of speaks to the longevity and the power of the brand and the um, earnings opportunity for our representatives. She is today's woman. She's the definition, in my mind, of a modern entrepreneur. Um, we have Avon representatives everywhere. Some of them, you know, are young and just out of school and do their business 100% on Facebook. And um, they use modern technology and modern tools to have a community of their friends, their colleagues, or pe perhaps people they work with. Uh, and then we have representatives. I met a few representatives over the last year. I was in 16 cities um, touching uh, tens and tens of thousands of representatives to celebrate our 125th. And um, we have Avon representatives that have been selling for well over 60 years, um, their whole life has been an Avon lady and they're proud of it. So it really spans the gamut. But um, Avon representatives really represent the average age demographic of any country because we have so many of them and they're, they're really today's woman everywhere. We talked about the 70s earlier on. It's a huge change in sort of women's self-perception. Absolutely. The company evolved as a company that was in homes, but then women went into the workforce. So the business model had to, again, transform itself. Then the business moved very internationally. Um, and so we became a global company from a US only company. We also have embraced the power of technology. So you had the digital revolution, you had the internet, uh, you've got everything from smartphones and everybody doing their business online. So we have had to morph and transform and um, keep up with the technologies, always though celebrating the individual sort of high touch relationship of uh, the woman to woman sales model as well as adding high tech. So each decade has come with a new force of industry change. Um, and in each decade over 125 years, we've had to change with the times. The 90s, it's still fairly late, especially for a company that is, as you said, all about women. I mean, it's just reading the motto, the company motto. Why do you think it did take so long to have a woman at the top? Avon had been ahead of its time, even with women in senior management. Uh, and women on the board. So I'm the ninth CEO and the first woman to run the company. But I think in the history books going forward, I'm uh, very hopeful and, and a big believer that there'll be as many women as men running the company over the next 125 years. Talk about the company when you joined. I mean, you joined in 93. I joined in 93. It's a very different company today. Um, you know, it's almost 20 years. And um, 
it's been a privilege to kind of have uh, led over some chapters and, and well over a decade. Uh, the brand at that time in 1993 was perceived uh, as sort of your grandmother's brand, a little bit of ding dong, Avon calling, and we have done a tremendous amount of heavy lifting to modernize that brand today from product formulas, product packaging, all the way to you know, some terrific celebrity spokesperson, uh, Reese Witherspoon, we have Fergie, um, as we've done a fantastic new fragrance with her. So it's a different image, Avon, and um, it's a very modern, very relevant, great value, but um, certainly a different brand than it was 10, 12 years ago. When you look back, what's your proudest achievement of that period? That is a very difficult question because m my career has been just a sum of just a tens and tens and tens of thousands of proud moments and they probably all come to a meeting an Avon representative, whether it's in Delhi or whether it's in Moscow or whether it's in Johannesburg, who come up to me and tell me, you know, because of this company, I've changed my life. Because of this company, I had really nothing. I'm now sending my children to America to earn. I had someone tell me that she was a victim of domestic violence um, and that only because of Avon was she able to get her life back together, become self-empowered, and today can support her children and today is um, really a leader in her community. And every one of those moments, which equals the sum of my career, I feel like, wow, I had the chance to be a part of something that actually did something good, that, that actually, you know, didn't just, you know, create earnings, but created true life-changing opportunities for women in many of the developing markets around the world where, you know, there's a purpose for a company like ours. When did you realize you could make it to the top, whether you had it in you or whether the company had it in itself to <laughs> pass, uh, you to pay know, that way? I never had the uh, dream, some people do, but when I joined the company, I just thought, this is a great company. This is a company that I really love. I didn't say, okay, I'm going to be the CEO of Avon. Even two years, 18 months before I became the CEO, I was actually passed over for the job. You've probably read about that. And um, I had a life moment, a career moment, because I was offered um, the CEO ships at a couple of other companies at the time. It was a very public um, sort of succession decision. And I had some advice from a mentor of mine who said, you know, follow your compass, not your clock. And I remember going home thinking, well, I can either go be a CEO for all the accoutrements that come with the title and the power of the job, or I can be number two, not number one, but stay with a company that I love, with work that I feel is deeply meaningful, and with people that I truly enjoy working with who have the same passion for what the company does. And in that decision to sort of follow my heart instead of my head, um, it was life-changing. I did get the job about 18 months later, and the rest is history. But I would have still made the same decision no matter if I was not the CEO 18 months later because, you know, life is very short. And if you're not involved in work that you have enormous passion for, then it's just a job. Or maybe it's a career. But it's not life's passion. It's not a love affair. And I've had a love affair with Avon. Tell me about that moment when you realized you wouldn't get it that first time. Was that a gut wrencher? The night that I was told that I would not be the CEO, I don't know if it was a gut wrencher, but it was an inflection point. Um, I, it, it, uh, you, go, you dive deep in yourself and say, OK, you know, someone else is going to come in and, and lead the company. And I'll either have to be extraordinarily supportive of that person or I can go off and do my own thing. And as I said, that, that decision was probably one of the more important decisions I've made in my life. But I tell a lot of young people, a lot of young women, and men as well, the story, because sometimes people feel like they have to follow the title, the money, what's expected of them, as opposed to what they really want to do. And you have those moments in life where you go left or you go right. And you know, I would never change this decision. Let's fast forward. So 18 months later, how did you feel when you... Oh, I remember that uh, it was about 10 p.m. at night, and I got a call from the then lead director of the board, and he said, well, congratulations. 
Madam CEO, and I remember waking my daughter up, who was young at the time, and saying, I've just become CEO of Avon. And she said, you're joking, right? Go back to sleep. You're dreaming. She was half asleep. <laughs> so yes, it was, um, well, I, I, I love the company so much, so I felt it was a privilege. Um, being the first woman CEO, obviously, an additional kind of mantle of responsibility and role modeling. You know, we have almost, you know, six, six and a half plus, almost seven million representatives down the road who they're mostly women. So the responsibility of um, kind of showing them that women can, can make it. If you believe in yourself, Avon is the company that gives you an opportunity. I, ha I, I got just to be luck the lucky embodiment of that thought that uh, is so true for all of our representatives. Is there added pressure as well? Is it still, are women still sort of marked in some sense? I think there's still a lot of pressure. I'm sure you're talking to many, many women who probably tell you the same thing. Is it quite an even playing field? Not quite yet, not quite. Getting better every day. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, I've been able to kind of see a decade. And I, I think that the next 10 years for women in business will be very different, even from the last 10. I think there's been a sea change even in the last two to three years, so it's progress. I mean, the numbers are still small, so it's hard to say there's no glass ceiling. Um, you know, there are, there are still fewer women than, than men in, in every echelon of business, but it's changing, and it's changing for the positive, and whether it's Meg, or whether it's Ginny Rometty at IBM, or Ursula at Xerox, some extraordinary women running some very large companies, and that, that is great, great progress. And if you kind of look in the, um, the level below CEO in terms of women who are in real strong roles, operating roles, CFOs, it's, um, it's a powerful group, so I think that they'll be able to feed and fuel uh, pr much progress on this over the next decade. I'm hopeful, anyway. What happens mid-career, either inside women or inside companies in terms of presence. I mean, it just seems like a real drop-off, but it seems like the issue seems to be earlier. I think there's a big opportunity to help women through that middle management lull. I think there's a lot of pressures, and uh, work-family balance is probably one of the ones that's still at the top of the list. I'm a believer that this is actually an issue for men as well as women. Dual-income families, raising young kids. I mean, it's just an issue everywhere. And uh, as I go around the world and talk to our associates or just kind of look at the business landscape, it's not just a US issue. I think it's one of the number one issues in the workplace all around the world. And finding either policies, flexible programs, ability to really help women through some of these issues is important. You know, we're a global company. One of the big things that we face is, you know, having women give, have take an opportunity perhaps in another country to be mobile, but they've got children, they may have a husband, can he move as well if he's working? So it's, you know, it's complicated. It's not that easy, but it is an important part of a career path at a multinational company. So these are all things that we have to deal with in terms of um, policies and in terms of investing in talent. For some women, there's a problem wearing ambition publicly, and then I, that affects things. I think that um, women and men shoulder or wear perhaps ambition a little bit differently. Um, even the word power, I'm, I'm not a fan of that word. People say, well, how does it feel to be on a powerful woman list? I prefer the word influence. I think that, um, and I don't know if that's a gender thought, but I, I would far prefer someone to say she had a role and she had the ability to really influence, influence decisions in a company, influence society, you know, influence, uh, again, the, um, the ability for women to succeed uh, and come up underneath her. But I, I think it's the more relevant word um, as far as I'm concerned because I don't think it's about power. Yeah. And talk about how you navigated this work-life conundrum. As you say, is it you know, eternal, really? I mean, I have two children that have lived through my career. My daughter's 22 and graduated from college and hoping to be a journalist. She's working at an uh, editorial, so She's um, in, a, in a very different path. Uh, my son has just turned 14, but um, you make the trade-offs. I, I can remember many instances where, you know, I have felt one day Avon's going to lose and one day my children are going to lose. Let's prioritize and make sure it's for the right thing. Have I missed a game or something for, for my children? I have. The most important? Never. So I'm always there for the most important things at the company. 
and I'm always there for the most important things for my children. But the other things that aren't as important, you've got to make that decision. You just can't feel guilty. You can't uh, be at a game and feel guilty that you're not at work or be at work feeling guilty you're not at the game because that's just a lose-lose. So I've learned to kind of compartmentalize and make those decisions, make those priorities, and then not look back. I remember that uh, I had an opportunity with five other male CEOs to go down to the White House. My daughter was young, and um, it was one of those situations where she needed me to be at a certain thing where mothers were going to send off their children. And I thought to myself, you know, the President of the United States is not going to remember tomorrow whether I was or wasn't at this lunch. But she is going to remember for the rest of her life whether I was or wasn't at this event. And I didn't go and ended up at the White House at another dinner, another month. But it's those kind of decisions that you make very importantly to, to prioritize. More broadly now on the women's movement, I mean, do you consider yourself a feminist? I really believe in an even playing field. Um, I don't think, I mean, we, we are the company for women, and sometimes people ask me, well, does that mean not for men? And I think we have an extraordinary number of amazing men and male leaders in the company. But I don't think it should be tilted to either too many women. I don't believe that the, our boardroom should be all women nor do I believe that it should be all men. So I guess I, I really believe in that equal opportunity thought or in my expression, even playing field. And I think it's the best balance. My own experience has been when I have an equal number of men and women opining on a decision, it's very balanced. Um, I think we come to a better place. Women and men make decisions in different ways. So it's, um, it's the best of, of all worlds. Why do you think feminism has become a dirty word? I don't think feminism is a dirty word. I, I do think it has a connotation um, that doesn't necessarily represent the thought of a balance. And um, so, from my own opinion, you know, I, I prefer, as I said, an even playing field type of thought. But throughout history, um, when I study women's movements, when I, you know, have been remarkably proud of women breaking through, whether it's in sports, arts, politics. You know, it, um, I think it does need that focus and attention, and it has needed that focus and attention to bring it to the forefront. You know, I, I move it to Avon for a minute. I mean, we are hugely involved as the Avon Foundation in uh, issues that matter to women most. Um, the foundation uh, is over 50 years old, um, but health and particularly breast cancer, continues to be the lion's share of the work that we do and the money we raise. Um, but issues about violence against women, human rights for women, which are still issues today in 2011, believe it or not, there needs to be a voice about it. And so, I don't call it feminist, but I would say there needs to be a strong voice to bring it to the forefront of society, of government. Uh, we were really proud to partner with Hillary Clinton and the State Department on a, a global initiative to really do something about violence against women, uh, particularly in the developing and emerging markets. There are staggering and sobering statistics. Um, there's sexual slavery. There is enormous violence, um, acid violence. I mean, you know, the stories are, are troubling, to say the least. And it's um, the 21st century, and it's unacceptable. So I think having a voice for issues, um, having a voice to continue to help women lead and break through is still important. Well, the Feminine Mystique landmark book, did you ever read that? Didn't tell me about it. I've tended to kind of read all things that, that come out and maybe I have different opinions on them, but um, if you just kind of go back, whether it was all of us remember Roe versus Wade, you know, I for one was extremely proud of Hillary Clinton's almost um, run for the presidency, and I, I think that it's a different time now. And um, if you kind of go back, whether it's through literature or people marking uh, women, the women's movement, and women breaking through, I'm a firm believer it different. The, the book will be different in ten years, and it will be a good one. Do you remember the Battle of the Sexes? Do you remember the Billie Jean King thing? I mean, you were young then, but do you remember that? I was I was young then, but uh, Billie Jean is an extraordinary role model. Um, and I, I think that um, 
you know, when you think of women's sports and, and, and women breaking through, how can you not think of Billie Jean King? What's the most meaningful piece of advice you've received? One of the most meaningful business pieces of advice that I've ever received is fire yourself and rehire yourself. Go home on a Friday night and um, just assume you were going to come in brand new on a Monday morning. What would you do differently? And I think it's great advice to anyone who's been in a job 10 years, 5 years, even 2 years, that, you know, every day you've got to kind of say, how do I reinvent myself? The business world is changing, the competitive environment is changing, and I need to be a different person tomorrow. Another great piece of advice came from an old boss I had very early on in my career. He had a poster behind his desk that was of a potted plant. And it simply said, bloom where you're planted. And people used to come into him all the time and say, I don't like my boss, I'm not liking this job, move me to another department. And he used to just point to this poster behind his desk and say, from the experiences that are most difficult in your career, you will learn the most. From the bosses that you hate the most, perhaps will be where you learn the most because you'll learn how to be a leader not like that. How to treat people better if you don't think you're being treated well. That you need to stay and take those moments that are difficult and embed them into how you can become a stronger person, a better leader, um, and that it'll be important to your career. And that was a great piece of advice. Uh, it, it kind of come, takes, it, go, it goes along the thought of persevere. Don't quit, don't give up too early. Learn from tough times as well as good times. What advice would you give a young woman? No matter what you do, you're gonna put in a tremendous amount of energy, a tremendous amount of commitment. You will you know, have that work-family balance dilemma that all of us have had. So find work that you love. Fall in love with what you do. Whether it's being a journalist, or whether it's being in business, or whether it's being you know, in sports, if you have a deep, deep passion for whatever it is that you do, um, all things being equal, you will excel. When you were a kid, what was your dream? I wanted to be a journalist. I was an English major. I loved to write. Um, I didn't think I could probably make a living writing novels. But I thought that uh, I, would, I would love to go and work for a great newspaper somewhere in the world. And the accomplishment you're most proud of? My children. Um, they're amazing, amazing kids. You know, when I think about how much they have um, lived with a um, mom who has certainly been on the road. We have 80% of our businesses in the developing and emerging world, so I'm always on a plane. Uh, the fact that they're extraordinarily grounded and um, they're proud of me for what I do. I've seen situations where it doesn't turn out like that, so I feel really, really lucky. And your first paying job? My first paying job was as a waitress at a lobster restaurant. And I um, did it during the summers and had to kind of do kitchen detail till 2 o'clock in the morning. Three adjectives that best describe you. I think that I'm extremely courageous. That would be one. Um, I've never really been afraid. Tough times, good times, I mean, I, I think I have a lot of courage, uh, and you have to. You certainly have to in these jobs. You have to have a strong stomach and um, grace under pressure, but I have a lot of courage. I, I am a persevering type. Um, I think this came from a lot of the uh, upbringing that I had, but I don't give up. That doesn't daunt me. I hate quitters, so I like to persevere. And then I believe in passion and compassion, that they're both really important. Hopefully people would describe me as a compassionate person, that business or no business, I remember my father when I became the CEO, I mean he was just concerned. You know, he had a prototype of what a CEO was and it wasn't a good picture. Tough, mean, you know, and he said just always be compassionate and I, I think I am. All these years later I think that um, the human spirit is something that I respect no matter even if you're having a tough conversation, having a really tough dialogue with an associate, they're human. They care, they matter, they have a family, so I think I'm compassionate. And the person you've never met who's had the biggest influence on your life? I would have liked to have met Mother Teresa. Um, I, you know, I mean, we all like to think that we can do a little bit to give back to humanity, to change the world, to give to those who are less fortunate, but she's got to be one of the top role models of all time. And now it's just a lightning round. iPad or notepad? iPad. Early bird or night owl? 
Early bird. Spontaneous or methodical? Spontaneous. Diplomatic or direct? Diplomatic. Type A or easy going? Easy going. Higher math score or higher verbal score? Higher math score. On my SATs I got an 800 in math and not an 800 in English and I still chose English. <laughs> Less boring. <laughs> Patient or impatient? Patient. Prada or Gap? Prada. Prepare or cram? Prepare. Domestically skilled or domestically challenged? Challenged. <laughs> Definitely domestically challenged. Ten minutes early or ten minutes late? Ten minutes late. <laughs> book smart or street smart? Mm, uh, book smart. 